All right. Uh, last paper of the conference. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me. I'm going to be presenting this paper joined with Ricardo Caballero, and it's called The Safety Trap. And it's going to be uh, quite related to the, to the paper that Gauti just presented. But still, I want to uh, take the opportunity here to uh, present a few slides of general introduction and putting some stylized facts uh, on the table. So the first one is this table that I took from a presentation by uh, Barclays Research. And uh, it's a table that seeks to document, and this is a very hard thing to do, so I'm not going to defend the specific choices that are behind it. They're trying to document what is the supply of safe assets as a fraction of world GDP. And uh, they computed in 2007, at the onset of the recent financial crisis, and 2011, well into the financial crisis. And the bottom line is that they come up uh, with this conclusion that the supply of safe assets shrunk from something like 37% of world GDP to 18% of world GDP. So it's a, a huge contraction, a halving of the supply of safe assets. And the big contributors that are behind that are uh, first a number of assets that are backed by residential land in the US that are deemed to be safe in 2007 and no longer perceived to be safe in 2011. And then the other call that they're making is that if you take periphery debt, periphery sovereign debt in Europe, it's something that's considered safe in 2007, no longer safe in 2011. So we can debate these choices, safe and not safe is not a black and white thing and everything, but it's just a graph that uh, is meant to convey the impression that I think is accurate that there was a contraction in the assets that were perceived to be safe, a substantial one, so a substantial shock. The second stylized fact is not controversial. It's the fact that we've seen a very large drop in the interest rate that uh, uh, co controls the price of these assets. So it's a short-term uh, short risk-free rate. And as you probably know, the short-term risk-free rate has dropped to zero and has been <coughs> stuck there for a, a quite a number of years now. That's the zero lower bound. And the third fact, uh, is uh, the observation that not all rate of returns have been zero during this period. Actually, some risk premia have been pretty high. Okay, and one way to uh, represent this, and this is taken again from this presentation by Barclays Research, is to, uh, to depict the realized rate of returns of different classes of assets. So the steeper the curve, the more risky the assets are. You're looking at the realized returns uh, over time. So the flatter line is one to three year US treasuries, the safest assets. And uh, their returns have been pretty much zero. Then you move to uh, government debt XUS, so G6 uh, government debt, and you see the, the light gray line. Then global credit assets, and then global equities. Okay, so you have zero interest rates, zero rates of returns for safe assets, but not for uh, other classes of risky assets. And the fourth stylus fact is also uncontroversial, is that this is a period where we've seen very uh, substantial unemployment. So a lot of slack uh, in the labor market, a lot of underutilized resources. So can we connect all these facts together? Okay, let's think about the first three facts together. The first three facts really scream for uh, uh, the idea that there's a shortage of safe assets. But there are, there's a benign view of safe asset shortages, okay? Safe assets are, are, are in, in uh, there's a shortage of safe assets, so their price is just gonna go up. What does that mean? That the interest rate for safe assets is gonna go down. And the benign view is that that's all there is to it. You're walking up and down a demand curve. The malign view, which is the one I'm gonna try to elaborate on in this talk, is the idea that the first three stylized facts are related to the four stylized facts. So the increase in unemployment, the fact that we've seen a huge recession, is related uh, to this development in asset markets. So it's going to be a, a version of the zero lower bound, but I'm going to try to make the argument that the reason why we reached the zero lower bound, which is a, short a shortage of sp safe assets in particular, is going to be very important uh, to think in particular about the policy implications and what sorts of policy remedies uh, can be successful at alleviating uh, the recession. So uh, just to try to convince you that I'm not hallucinating, uh, here's a quote by a policymaker. He's the chairman of the Minneapolis Fed that tries to make that connection uh, also. I'm going to read it to you. So this is from Narayana Kushalakota. 
In my view, the biggest challenge for central banks is changes in the, natural, uh, uh, in the nature of asset demand and asset supply since 07. Those changes are shaping current monetary policy and are likely to shape policy for some time to come. The demand for safe financial assets has grown greatly since 07. At the same time, the supply of the assets perceived to be safe has shrunk over the past six years. Americans thought in 2007 that it was highly unlikely that American residential land and assets backed by land could ever fall in value by 30%. They no longer think that. Similarly, investors around the world viewed all forms of European sovereign debt as a safe investment. They no longer think that either. And then he connects it with uh, low interest rates and the need for the Fed to provide uh, monetary stimulus. So uh, I'm going to try to flesh out that story. Uh, and today I want to walk you through a simple model, a simple structure to organize our thoughts, uh, to think about these facts. The phenomenon, I'm going to refer to it as a safety trap, and this is both to emphasize the similarities with the liquidity traps and some of the, some of the differences. And the differences have to do with the reason why you reach the zero lower bound. I'll talk a lot about policy, which policies are effective uh, in a safety trap. And you'll see there that the reasons why you reach the zero lower bound are very important. I'll talk also uh, a bit about uh, inflation and, uh, if I have time, about financial bubbles and, and how financial bubbles can look like in a secular stagnation environment. So here's my basic structure, and I'm going to try to keep the amount of mathematics to uh, a minimum. So I'm going to start a bit uh, using the strategy that Gauti used with the real economy. Uh, so where you know, goods are falling from the sky, it's an endowment economy. And then I'll add a monetary side and, and frictions to it. So there's an endowment that's output in the economy. It's equal to x, completely constant, unless there's some kind of uh, event that occurs. I'm going to call that a Poisson event because it's controlled by the realization of a Poisson process. And that event can be good, in which case GDP goes up permanently, or it can be bad, in which case GDP goes down permanently. I'm going to study the limit where the intensity of these two processes is going to zero. So these shocks are very unlikely, but they can be there. And you'll see that, uh, in particular, the bad shock, even though it's very unlikely, it's going to carry a long shadow in the minds of investors, and uh, it had, it's going to have a profound impact on the equilibrium. Other than that, uh, my structure is going to be an overlapping generation structure, so uh, similar in that sense to the one that Gauti used. And I'm going to use a trick that economists call uh, the perpetual youth model. So uh, agents are going to be born and are going to die uh, with uh, uh, a constant rate uh, that I'm going to denote by theta. So uh, what's going to happen is that an agent is going to be born. He's going to earn some income. He's going to save it. And he's going to consume everything when he dies. So that's a very uh, schematic way of representing the life cycle where you earn some income during your working days, you save it for retirement, and then uh, you consume it. So it's a stylized version of that. The output is going to be uh, divided between the income of newborns, the income that I just talked about, and it's going to be a fraction 1 minus delta of the endowment. And then the rest is going to uh, accrue in the form of dividends on assets that are going to be traded in this economy. Delta X. What's going to be absolutely key is that in my model, there are going to be two classes of agents. There are going to be 19s and neutrons. What's a 19? It's an agent that's extremely risk averse. Okay? It's an agent that's going to demand safe assets, basically. So they don't want to bear any risk between a period T and the subsequent period. And they're going to, uh, in order to do that, they're going to invest their portfolio in entirely uh, safe assets. The remaining of the population is neutrals, they're risk neutral, and the only thing they care about when they invest their portfolios is what's the rate of return. So they're, they're uh, not risk averse, unlike the 19s. So you're going to have uh, uh, some wealth in this economy, and it's going to be divided by, between neutrals and between 19s. And how much wealth is controlled by neutral people and by 19 people is going to be very important. So uh, remember, these agents are born, they earn some income, and then they want to save. The thing that's going to distinguish uh, the neutrals and the 19s is how they save, how they invest their portfolios, what stores of values uh, they want to acquire. So what are going to be the stores of values that are going to be there in this economy? 
Well, first you're going to have locus trees, so assets that are going to be claims to the dividends in this, uh, in this economy. And these assets, they're going to be managed by neutrals. And so the neutrals are going to own these assets, they're going to be risky assets, and they're going to securitize them. So uh, backed by these risky assets, they're going to issue safe assets to the 19th. Okay, so they're going to act as an intermediary uh, to the 19th, and that's going to be where all the securitization in the economy uh, is going to take place. And I'm going to introduce a friction there. So they're going to be able to securitize, but not perfectly. And the way I'm going to do that is by introducing a financial friction and saying that a fraction of the dividends that accrues on the trees that the neutrals are managing, they cannot pledge to outside investors. They could run away with it, for example, or any kind of agency problem, uh, really, that you might think might occur between these managers and, uh, and investors. Okay? So they can securitize, but up to some limit. And Rho, you can think about it as the securitization capacity uh, of the economy. Okay, so now we have risky assets and safe assets. The total value of assets is gonna be the sum of those two. And uh, we can easily back out what the supply of safe assets is going to be. So I'm not showing you the math for that, but basically you see that the supply of safe assets is increasing in the securitization capacity of the economy. So the, the easier it is to securitize, the more safe assets are gonna be generated. And uh, the, the, if the shock is not too bad, this is how much the output declines if there's a bad shock. So if U minus is high, that means that the shock is not too bad. In that case, it's easier to create safe assets because there isn't that much, there's not that much aggregate risk in the economy. So a lot of safe assets, if it's easy to create them, and if there's not too much aggregate risk uh, in the economy. So uh, I'm going to focus entirely on steady states where everything is constant. And there's a theorem in the background that tells you that you will always converge to such a, such a situation. Uh, just by uh, the requirement that you need to clear the goods market, it has to be the case that total wealth, W, times how much of that wealth is going to be consumed, which is theta, has to be equal to the supply of goods in the economy. So that gives you immediately what the value of total wealth is going to be. Because the asset market has to clear, that's also going to be the value of assets. And if you apply that after the bad Poisson shock, that tells you why the supply of safe assets is given by. Now, what's interesting is that um, the safe assets and the risky assets, because uh, they might be held by different agents, they're going to command different risk, uh, rates of return. Okay. So the neutrals, they're going to be able to hold safe and risky assets but the 19s are only going to hold safe assets. As a result, it has to be the case that the rate of return on safe assets is lower than the rate of return on risky assets. There are going to be two regimes depending on who the marginal investor for safe assets is. There's an unconstrained regime where the marginal investor for safe asset is a neutral, in which case the two rates of returns are the same. And you see that that happens if uh, the supply of safe assets is large enough or if the demand for safe asset is small enough. Alpha is the fraction of 19 uh, in the U. So that's not going to be the interesting regime for us. The interesting regime is going to be the constrained regime, which occurs when uh, there's a lot of demand for safe assets and not that much. And in that case, the marginal holder of a safe asset is a 19, a very risk averse. So there's really a shortage of safe assets in the situation. And as a result, their price is going to go up, which means that the, the interest rate on safe assets you're going to have a risk premium or a safety premium that's going to open up between the safe asset and the risky asset. This is where I introduce uh, the nominal uh, friction. Okay. So uh, we're going to add Keynesian features to this model. So I'm going to add production. And basically, you have to interpret the output that I was talking about as potential output. And uh, I'm going to add sticky prices or sticky wages uh, to the picture also. And to make things very stark, to begin with, I'm going to make prices or wages completely rigid. So there's no scope for adjustment whatsoever. Later on, I'll relax that assumption and uh, look at what happens with uh, inflation. There are really two key features that I'm adding compared to the previous model. The first one is uh, uh, the idea that uh, output is demand determined. 
So that's the Keynesian feature, because you have sticky prices. And the second one is the zero lower bound. Why is there a zero lower bound? Well, the zero lower bound arises because you have money in the model. And money, by definition, doesn't pay any interest. But it can't be that a safe asset is dominated by money. In that case, you would never hold a safe asset. Money is a safe asset uh, itself. There's a zero lower bound on the interest rate that you cannot break. Okay. So this model has uh, the property that if prices were flexible, <coughs> the equilibrium would be the same as the endowment economy <coughs> that I described before. And even if prices are sticky, as long as the interest rate is positive, you can achieve that flexible price allocation with no inflation by just setting the normal interest rate equal to uh, the natural interest rate. And the LT explained to you what the, the natural uh, interest rate is. But now imagine a situation where you know, we keep following the, the thought experiment that I used in my first slide. Imagine that the supply of safe asset goes down. As the supply of safe asset goes down, uh, the, the, the interest rate, the safe interest rate is going to drop. And at some point, it's going to reach zero. So what happens then? Well, that's the experiment. Okay. At an unchanged interest rate, you're going to have excess demand for safe assets and excess supply for growth. How will the equilibrium be restored? Well, if the interest rate is positive, you're just going to have a reduction in interest rate. But if interest rate is zero, it can't go down anymore. So something else has to give. And what I will show you is that in this model, equilibrium is restored by a contraction in output. So it's the recession uh, that uh, decreases the demand for safe assets and restores equilibrium. So you can think about it as there's a virtuous equilibrating mechanism, which is the decline in interest rate, but can only occur if interest rates are positive. And that virtuous mechanism breaks down when interest rates reach zero. And it's replaced by a perverse equilibrating mechanism where the equilibration comes from a reduction now. So this is a diagram that illustrates that. Uh, here you have uh, the demand and the supply for safe assets and the safe interest rate. And what you see here is that uh, the demand for safe assets is increasing in the safe interest rate. The higher is the safe interest rate, the more wealth the 19s are going to accumulate over it. And then this is the supply for safe assets. And here I'm doing the thought experiment where the supply of safe assets is shrinking. So if the interest rate were positive, you would just move along the dark blue curve you'd move along the demand curve. The only thing that would happen is a decline in the interest rate. But if the interest rates are already at zero, that can't happen. And instead what happens is that output drops. And because output drops, the income and the wealth of 19 goes down, so the demand for safe asset goes down. You see that the demand curve shifts. And this is what restores equilibrium. So you see the, the virtuous and the, mal the, the benign and the, and, the, and, the, and the malign equilibrating mechanisms at work uh, in this picture. So there's a way to represent it from, uh, by looking at the, at, at the aggregate demand for goods. So uh, here is a Keynesian cross, okay? just like you're in your undergrad textbooks. And you can represent the equilibrium uh, like a Keynesian cross. So this is the 45 <coughs> degree line. Okay. And this is, uh, uh, which expresses supply as a function of output. Because output is demand determined. Uh, Ah, it's just the 45 degree line. And then this is the aggregate demand curve. And the aggregate demand curve increases when uh, output increases, but less uh, than one for one. So it's flatter uh, than the aggregate demand. And uh, you can see this exact representation here. And what happens is that if you have a contraction in the supply for safe assets, it acts like a shifter in the aggregate demand uh, curve. So when there's a contraction in the supply for safe assets, aggregate demand shifts down. And as a result, output shifts down. And you can see what happens when the interest rate is positive. Instead of uh, aggregate demand shifting down, the interest rate adjusts. So that aggregate demand doesn't move. Yeah, that mechanism can't uh, can work uh, when the interest rate is zero. All right, so that's how it works. So you get a recession. You can connect uh, all the facts that I talked about uh, in the introduction. Now, how does that connect with secular stagnation? So secular stagnation is the idea that we can be at the zero lower bound with a recession for a very long time, maybe forever. Well, in this environment, the safety trap can be very persistent. Actually, it can be permanent. And uh, an interesting uh, and 
important observation is that you can have a permanent zero lower bound even with long-term assets. Okay, so in the US economy, for example, you have land. Land is a long-lived asset. So something that goes a bit against the idea of zero interest rates forever is that this would imply that the price of land would be infinite. So here, this is not the case. And the re uh, so you can have land, and the price of land will still be finite, even though interest rates are at zero forever, because uh, land is risky. So the only interest rate, the only rate of return that is equal to zero is the safe interest rate. So if you have long-lived assets, but these assets are risky, then uh, they don't have to have an infinite value. So now let's think about policy. Okay. And I'm going to talk about forward guidance, I'm going to talk about QE, and I'm going to talk about inflation targeting very quickly. So what's forward guidance? I'm going to try to uh, explain it uh, and capture it in a very stylized way. So imagine that uh, the, after the good shock, remember, we are, we're at the zero lower bound with the recession, and we can have either a very bad shock or we can have a very good shock. When the good shock occurs, the economy recovers. And what you can try to do is when the economy recovers, instead of raising the interest rate, you keep the interest rates at zero. So that's what forgetting means. It's promising low interest rates in the future when the economy recovers. But let's see, and, and in standard models of the liquidity trap, uh, it's a, a policy that works, uh, that is very effective. Let's see how it works uh, in this model. So if you keep the interest rate uh, uh, at zero for a while after the good shock, you're going to stimulate the economy after the good shock. So you will have a boom. You will increase asset values. You will increase wealth. In the standard model, this increase in asset value would increase asset values today. If you think the asset is going to be worth more in the future, it will increase in value today. But not so in this model. Instead, what's going to happen is that there's going to be an increase in risk premium that's going to completely kill the impact of uh, future, higher future asset values on today's asset values. What's going to happen is that today's asset values is not going to change at all. Okay. So forward guidance is going to look like a failed attempt to stimulate aggregate demand by reflating risky assets. But it's not going to work at all. So it's a very extreme result that comes from the extreme assumption that I've made here. But it makes the point that uh, uh, we may be overstating the effic the, uh, how efficacious forward guidance is. And that connects with uh, a term that people are starting to use, which is the forward guidance puzzle, which is basically this idea that forward guidance works beautifully in some of our models, but doesn't seem to have as much leverage uh, in practice. Uh, so for example, John and Amy uh, with Alistair McKay have uh, another rationalization for uh, this forward guidance puzzle that's related uh, to uh, let me mention a quip by Bernanke, I think that's uh, interesting and relevant for that. He had this, uh, this, uh, this observation, he said, well, forward guidance works in theory but not in practice, and QE works in practice but not in theory. <laughs> <laughs> so here, uh, it doesn't work in theory, and it, it doesn't work in practice, so it's consistent. So now I want to talk about QE, precisely. Uh, in order to talk about QE, uh, I need to introduce some public assets. So public debt. I'm going to do that and assume that there's a short-term public debt, and it's going to be financed by some taxes. And for reasons, some variety of reasons, I'm using taxes on dividends. Bottom line is, it maps into the model that we use so far, but it uh, changes. The, you have to replace the securitization parameter by uh, this combination of R. And so what's going to be interesting for us is whether when we do QE or when we issue public debt, we increase the supply of safe assets or not. It's going to be all about understanding that function. So you can work it out uh, in our model. And basically, there are going to be two regimes. If, uh, if uh, the securitization constraint is, uh, is, if the, the, is, if securitization is sufficiently impaired, you're going to be in a non-recurrent region, where basically when you issue uh, public assets, you're not going to crowd out private safe assets. So by issuing more public assets, you're going to expand the supply of safe assets. And uh, by doing that, you're going to stimulate the economy. By contrast, if the securitization capacity of the economy is very good, 
then you're going to be in the Ricardian region where you're going to completely crowd out private safe assets when you shoot more. So uh, basically, uh, by issuing uh, public debt, and perhaps at the same time by purchasing private risky assets, so that's QE, then uh, you can stimulate the economy in this model as long as you're not in the fully uh, recurring. Uh, let me just mention uh, inflation, and there uh, I want to, I mean, this is something that we added to the model after I saw uh, Gauti's uh, earlier presentation, but it's very much inspired by what they do. Uh, so we introduce uh, a Phillips curve that uh, becomes vertical uh, at some point. And you have a diagram that looks very much like uh, the one they have. And the bottom line is that uh, basically by uh, increasing the inflation target, uh, you can create a good equilibrium that gets rid of the recession, and you can't get rid of the bad equilibrium. Uh, other than that, there's no qualitative change in the paper, but all the Keynesian multipliers get bigger because now there's a, a feedback loop with inflation. So if you stimulate output, you increase inflation, which stimulates output even further. And uh, I want to uh, just say one word uh, about bubbles. Uh, so one of the, uh, a part of the, the speech by Summers that I found very interesting is the connection with uh, financial uh, bubbles in secular stagnation And here we do that in the paper. And long story short, what we find is that we introduce two kinds of bubbles, risky bubbles and safe bubbles. Risky bubbles can crash, safe bubbles don't crash. What we find is that risky bubbles do not stimulate uh, the economy, do not increase the supply of safe assets. And that's, that should be pretty important. And that connects with some observation by Summers that even if you have a big financial bubble, a risky one, then you won't see a very large expansion, expansion associated with it. By contrast, uh, uh, if you have a safe bubble, uh, then it's going to stimulate output. So what's a safe bubble? You could think about money or government debt in environments where the interest rate is zero forever uh, or less than the growth rate of the economy forever as a financial bubble. So that would relax uh, the, 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 the constraints on fiscal capacity for the government because if interest rates are permanently lower than the growth rate of the economy, then you can sustain uh, some debt without ever having to raise taxes. And the government could, uh, could try to leverage that. Okay. So let me conclude. Uh, that was the model. And what we're working on now is uh, an international version. Thanks, Emmanuel. The discussion is uh, Jesus Fernandez Valverdez from UPenn. Thank you very much. So it's really a pleasure to uh, read such an interesting paper. It builds on many of the ideas that Emmanuel and Ricardo have built in uh, a lot of their previous papers. And one of the great things about reading Emmanuel's papers with his different co-authors <coughs> is that I'm always quite amazed by the tactful craftsmanship with which he's able to mix together a very nice, judicious choice of assumptions, a very nuanced use, in this case, of continuous time processes, and the right mix of technical results and intuition. And I don't know if I have told you that or not, but I always like your papers because I read them off to come up with my exam questions for the prelim in macro at Penn. And I don't know if how many of the graduate students are aware of that, but since it's an overlapping generation yeah. model, I think that that part of information doesn't go through. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so keep writing papers. It saves me a lot of time every June when I try to come up with a prelim question. <laughs> and this is a particularly interesting paper because it really helps us to, or force us, depending on how you think about it, about thinking about many of the issues uh, related with the zero lower bound uh, from an alternative perspective. And in particular, as Emmanuel has emphasized, a lot of the implications and uh, for policy. Now, uh, I was here last year visiting as a, as a professor, and I guess that everyone at Princeton knows I could probably talk two hours about any topic on the planet. Uh, but I'm keenly aware that I'm a little bit like the second act of Siegfried, something that you need to endure before you get to the much more interesting third act, 
which in this case, instead of Brunild and uh, Siegfried falling in love, is Larry Summers giving you, uh, giving you his uh, thoughts. So I'm going to try to be as brief as I can. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about the motivation for the paper. I'm going to compare the standard neo Keynesian model and the liquidity trap that appears in this model with the safety model of Ricardo and Emmanuel. I'm going to discuss some of the policy implications. I'm going to talk a little bit about possible extensions of the paper, which I will find interesting. And then I'm going to present some, and I'm going to call them myself crazy, alternative policy proposals to think about the safe asset trap. And I guess that both in Gotti's and Emmy's uh, presentation, and now with um, Emmanuel's presentation, it's very clear that a lot of what is interesting about macroeconomics is that we know that intertemporal trade is hard. So you go and take your class in micro, and you know, mm. intratemporal trade, you find sometimes there is asymmetric information and issues like that. But at the end of the day, we tend to believe that markets tend to do a reasonable job. The real problems come when we are thinking about intertemporal trade. And why many of these problems appear is because for a market economy to work roughly right, we need a key market to work properly, which is the market that equates saving and investment. The problem is that if we have an economy that has both cash or any other form of highly liquid assets that can be stored and yield you some type of rate of return, even if that rate of return is only zero in nominal terms, and two, you have some type of price rigidities, this economy faces a problem, which is you basically can hit against this rate of return imposed by this outside asset, like the cash, and then basically think about it as a key, a key price in the economy that cannot adjust. And since we have basically one market that cannot adjust because that price is not working properly, by Walras law, everything else in the economy is not working. Okay? And in particular, the only way in which we can achieve market clearing is through quantities. And that's why it's so important to have price rigidities. Because if we have price rigidities, the other possible uh, way to adjust, which will be inflation going up and down at a sufficiently fast rate, cannot work either. So if we have this both cash and two price rigidity conditions, the, we are going to find is that certain conditions, we are going to have these reductions in output that are going to achieve the equilibrium in the saving investment market. So how does this work in the standard uh, neo Keynesian model? And this is the standard uh, neo Keynesian model that has been really nice to me over the years, and I have been able to convince many editors to publish these papers. So it's basically a model where you have a representative agent or extremely boring form of household heterogeneity. It's going to be a model where, as a consequence, this representative agent needs to be induced to hold all the capital in the economy. In the case that you don't have capital, then basically it needs to be a situation where it holds uh, zero net assets. And the interest rate at which this can happen may be negative. For instance, because you have a huge preference shock such that this representative agent wants to save so much, so much that you actually hit against the bound. And in fact, the lower uh, what is going to happen, as I was mentioning before, is that prices are not going to increase sufficiently fast. And price rigidities, this is something very important that sometimes is not sufficiently well understood, is not that price rigidities imply that prices cannot go down sufficiently fast. It's that prices cannot go up sufficiently fast. Because if prices can go up sufficiently fast, then you have inflation. And if you have inflation, the real interest rate can go down sufficiently fast. And then, of course, when well, well, the consequence is going to be that the real interest rate is not going to have the right value, and since it's not going to have the right value, we are going to have a recession. Now, this model, since we have a boring form of heterogeneity or a representative agent, implies that there is nothing very interesting to say about asset pricing or about asset heterogeneity. And since there is nothing very interesting to say about asset heterogeneity, we can go back to the original result in a famous paper by Neil Wallace in 1981, which later Gotti and Mike Woodford uh, re-emphasized in 2003, that basically says QE doesn't have any type of implication. And it doesn't have any type of implications because with this representative agent at a government, the only thing that we are doing by changing asset allocations is changing portfolios without any type of real consequences. How is the safety trap model that Emmanuel and Ricardo are presenting? Well, it takes a different uh, look at the issues. Basically, it starts with a fundamental type of heterogeneity. And I think this is very important to understand. They say, look, we are going to get away from this representative agent setup or from 
kind of boring forms of heterogeneity, and we are going to have this much more fundamental form of heterogeneity, which is having these Knightian agents and these neutral agents. And in addition to it, we need to have some type of market incompleteness. So there is going to be some issue related with having some assets and different heterogeneous assets. And the way they are going to do it is by introducing overlapping generation models. Always a lot of fun. I just finished teaching my semester at Penn first year macro, and I always spend three weeks talking about overlapping generations and having some form of limited pledgeability of these assets. And basically what is going to happen is that under certain conditions, the safe assets issued by neutrals are not enough to clear the market at positive interest rates, given what the Knightians agents want to get. And that is going to basically limit the transfers that can happen between the Knightians and the neutrals. And in particular, this is going to have an effect on the spreads. If I had a little bit more time, I will explain it more carefully, but Emmanuel, I think, did a great job about it. And the good thing about the paper is that once you have these two characteristics, this fundamental form of heterogeneity and this form of market incompleteness, the rest of the paper in some sense is rather standard. And I don't know how many of you remember the beautiful book by Seller and Jitman, uh, 1066 and all that. And it's a book about the English history and every time something good happens, they say, and it's a good thing. So the fact that the rest of the model is completely standard is actually a good thing. And they can have this falling output and this situation of secular stagnation. So what are the three key elements in the model? One, that you have a fundamental form of heterogeneity. Two, that you have some type of limitation on the ability of agents to issue safe assets. And three, that you have some form of output demand determination. And I think that the authors put all these three uh, uh, components very nicely with some particular choices, but it's my suspicion that you can probably come up with many different environments that have these three characteristics. doesn't need to be night times versus uh, neutrals. It can be maybe people with higher risk aversion versus lower risk aversion, younger versus old, etc. You can have different forms of demand determination where you will get at the end of the day the same consequence. That basically you are going to have a demand for safe assets that cannot be satisfied at a positive interest rate and then because of demand determination of output, you are going to have a recession. The policy implications, I think that Emmanuel did a very good job and in the interest of time, I'm going to skip them a little bit. So let me get into a little bit uh, different stuff. Possible model extensions that I would like to see, I always like models with capital. And the reason why I like models with physical capital that enters into the production function is because physical capital gives you some type of product of production, and that actually sets down some type of long run real interest rate. It is true that with adjustment cost, in the short run, you can have some type of Tobin skew, and you are going to be separated from uh, that in the market. But having private capital, I think productive capital, excuse me, I think is really important to understand really the long run dynamics, dynamics of the model. I think that one could think a little bit more about the endogeneity of how much an asset is pledgeable versus not pledgeable. In fact, this is something I'm working a little bit with Tano Santos at Columbia Business School, where we are thinking about why it may be the case that now there are assets that are less pledgeable than in the past. We could have richer forms of heterogeneity. I already mentioned that, maybe in the tradition of Gotti, having some type of richer overlapping generation structure. I will think that a very nice extension of the model will be to connect with labor markets. And if I had a little bit more time, I could mention stuff like that, in particular of how the uncertainty may feed back to the labor market, may feed to the type of assets that we have. And in particular, because changes in the zero uh, of the interest rate may have also an impact on labor supply. Something that I'm not quite sure, I have asked many people working in this secular stagnation, is this distinction between trends versus levels. And what happens in a lot of these models is, yes, you have a lower level of output, but it may be the case that you are still growing at the same rate. And I think that, on the other hand, there are people who are worried about growth levels. So it will be interesting to have models that help us to think a little bit about this distinction between secular stagnation in trends versus levels. And then, and finally, I think this is not a surprise to anyone who knows me. I'm into quantitative stuff. I like to have big computers that uh, produce a lot of CO2. And I like to have numbers and see how far we can get with these stories. And just to conclude, let me talk about some possible other crazy policies. And the argument is, what is the safety trap? The safety trap is about too many risky, risky assets, uh, sorry, too many risk adverse savers chasing too few safe assets. 
what, what, what can we do? Well, there is a demand and there is a supply curve, and something we can do is work on both sides. Population aging. Population aging, that was, for, for instance, part of uh, Gotti's argument, implies that there is a lot of people saving for the future. What we can do? We can do something that on the right side of the spectrum we like a lot, which is to increase retirement age, so people will save less because they are going to be retired for less uh, side, but we can also do something that people, uh, I guess, from the other perspective, will also like, which is to increase the replacement rate, because that will mean that they also need to save less. So let's make people retire later at a, at a better pensions, they will need to save less. We can also work on better insurance devices at individual level, which will imply that people need to save less uh, and re uh, require less safe assets. Regulatory considerations, a lot of the reasons people need to keep safe assets is because regulations implies them to do that. So let's substitute that, for instance, for having higher equity requirements. And in particular, also we can work on trying to reduce the high levels of aggregate uncertainty, which I have argued in other papers are related with some of the policy decisions made over the last few years. And we can also work, and with this I finish, on the supply side of assets. And part of the reasons why there may not be a lot of safe assets right now being issued is because there is less private investment. And I have argued in other contexts that contrary to some type of implications or some type of policy discussions where you are at the zero lower bound, it's actually a great time to do supply side policies, especially if those have a permanent effect. So by doing those type of things, you may unravel a lot of opportunities for investment and generate safe assets. You can think about more public investment in the right type of projects, in particular Baseto and Tom Sarian have a very nice paper in QG in 2006 where they talk about how you can spin off some of these capital projects and then issue debt to finance those capital projects. And it's totally crazy that we still only have Lincoln and Holland Tunnel to go to New York. And there can be issues also to increase the ability to pledge assets. And this is what I'm going to call some type of good uh, financial innovation. And maybe we can work on the issue that there is not enough public debt. Anyway, as a conclusion, I think this is an extremely interesting paper. I really learned much from it. And I think it really opens the door to force us to think about many of the policy implications that are different between the standard Neokensian model that every person is using these days, especially at the Fed, and the type of policy implications that come from a, a safe trap. Thank you. Thanks, Jesus. So let's add two more questions to the discussion. Are there any questions concerning the safety trap? In the absence of question, just a bibliographic note, one of the three vehicles that Minsky proposes for big government stabilizing an unstable economy is precisely the generation of safe assets at a time of contraction in the private sector. Do you want to respond to Jesus? Uh, thanks a lot, Jesus, for a, a great discussion. I'm going to keep it uh, short. Um, so you mentioned a bunch of extensions that I think are very interesting. I just uh, found a paper that uh, tackles one of them. It's about uh, secular stagnation and trans versus level. So there's a nice paper by Benigno and Fornaro, which is about Keynesian growth. And so the idea is that when levels are reduced, then the incentives to innovate are also lower. And so maybe growth uh, can be lower. And they, are, they articulate that in in a nice paper. When it comes to policies, uh, I thought the most uh, provocative ones uh, and the ones I've thought a lot about are uh, regulation. And it's about some of the adverse consequences that are really macroeconomic consequences of regulation that need to be taken into account if you have this perspective that there's a shortage of safe assets. So some of the regulations of the financial sectors that are being introduced are forcing insurance companies and things like that to hold more safe assets. And to the extent that that increases the demand for safe assets, it could have macroeconomic implications. So that's something that I think should be kept in mind when we think about those regulations. Um, I also want to mention two policies that I didn't talk about in the paper that you have not mentioned. One has to do with taxes. So I've, I've worked on, in another paper on the possibility of using tax incentives at the zero lower bound. And that remains a strategy that has leverage here. So you could try to have a sales tax holiday, for example, coupled with an investment tax credit. And that would be a way of stimulating the economy that would be very effective uh, in those models. 
and that remains true here. And for some reason, these uh, tools used to be part of the toolkit that we had to fight recessions, and they're not so much, so much there anymore. And, uh, and I'm not exactly sure uh, why that's the case, because I think they're a good idea. The other policy that uh, is, is promising in those contexts is redistribution. If you have a way of taxing 90s in some way and redistributing wealth to, to neutrals, then that would do wonders uh, in an economy like this one. And more generally, these are environments where uh, when you do redistribution, you have uh, macroeconomic stabilization consequences that you need to take into account. But the 90s, maybe actually the poor people. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you need to be careful. You need to do it the right way. <laughs> So they perhaps you can elaborate a little bit more. I mean, many people argue that all these QE measures and Fed interventions might have led to a redistribution towards uh, the rich rather than to the poor. And I was wondering whether you can also allude to the zero lower bound. Some economists proposing, you know, electronic money get rid of cash in order to get rid of the zero lower bound. Uh, what happens if, if you were to get rid of the zero lower bound? Can you imagine another friction which would then step in into the place of the zero lower bound? Oh, no, okay, so that's the key freak. I mean, I can think of many frictions in general, <laughs> but for this particular mechanism, uh, it's really it's really key. So, I mean, to the extent that it's possible in some medium run to move uh, to electronic money without having uh, the downsides that come to mind when you think about that, I think that would be uh, that would be a great idea. Even with with money, actually, we're seeing some countries experiment with negative interest rates. And nobody's quite sure exactly where the limit is. It's clear that it's not exactly zero, but uh, exactly where it is, is is a bit unclear. But maybe we have a little more scope to go there. A few years ago, I brought an op-ed in Spain suggesting going to electronic money. Man, did I get hate email for like a month. <laughs> <laughs> that's so how that's a nerve from people. So I don't know if it is for Greg Mankiw, once he, he, like, that's the one time he got into trouble. He wrote a, an op-ed in the New York Times suggesting basically ways of taxing money, which had to do with, uh, you look at the serial numbers on the bills oh, yeah, and, you would, that, yeah. and you would retire bills with a certain probability. And he almost got fired over that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let's get ready uh, to the... So we are starting.